And welcome back to Fatimals presentation on the Ravens Rap Show right here on the Resort Video Guide as we continue on on this Monday after the Ravens defeat the Giants 27 to 13. And they put themselves in a great position down the fifth seed, the AFC playoffs, to get a win and they're in Sunday against Cincinnati. They won't need any other help. But joining us, our special guest, uh, longtime tenured PR chief of the Ravens. And uh, according to the Ravens website, Kevin, executive vice president, Kevin Burke <laughs> joining us. And uh, good evening. Happy holidays to you. And thanks so much for joining us. Good to talk to you again, Kevin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays and hope everybody had a great Christmas and have a great start to a new year beginning uh, this Sunday in Cincinnati. Indeed. That, that looks like a golf course with the, the lighthouse, lake tower behind you. Let's see. That is, uh, we're in Hilton Head. That's, that's right. a painting that's our son Tim did, and uh, he, he put the uh, lighthouse that's famous here, uh, and uh, so it's well done. It's a little advertisement for young Tim. It's beautiful. Nice. So is that what you call home these days? Yes, yes, it, it is home. I'm, I'm still uh, helping the Ravens out in some small ways and uh, enjoying that and exchanged some texts with Steve Bishotti yesterday afternoon <laughs> about how crazy our 18 hours had been and watching, you know, the night before and John Gruden uh, and the Raiders losing that game. And then at the end of our game, flipping, going, having multiple televisions going on as we tried to see what was happening at the end of the Browns and the Steelers game. It was a wild, wild uh, 16, 18 hours. It really was. I was going to ask you if watching the games has changed for you now that your role has <laughs> I mean dramatically are you throwing things at the tv like I do now I can <laughs> I can I can you know up in the press box as you know Tony right. you, I can't do anything you know so right. the, the the most I can do is kind of stand or contort or hit a fist on a big play but here uh, my wife's a little startled at times because I'll go wait what are we doing? Why are we doing that? Or look at that. Hey, we're in. Let's go. You know, so it's 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 a, a little more relaxing, but still nerve wracking. I, I have a name for it, Kevin. I call it football Tourette's. <laughs> That's very good. I might use that. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> Tony, go ahead. I know we, we've got a ton of questions for Kevin. As I mentioned, he's a wealth of knowledge, not only with the Ravens, but of course his time with the Browns and the league as a whole. So. Well, well, Kevin, you know, this has been an unusual year to say the least. I know it's changed for you with the COVID situation. Mike and I had Jeff Zarebeck, who I know you know well, on with us a couple of weeks ago. And Jeff was under the impression and, and was under the belief that the Ravens would be penalized pretty severely by the league, given the punishments that were given out to the New Orleans Saints and to the Tennessee Titans, the punishment he thought was going to include at least a draft pick. It didn't happen that way. A $250,000 fine, that's like most people would say, well, that's chump change to an NFL team. And relatively speaking, it may be, but at the same time, it's a significant amount of money. But did you think that the league was going to come down on the Ravens a little harder than they did? I was hoping they wouldn't, to be honest, right. but, but, but knew because the schedule had had to be adjusted because of, of our situation, you know, the, the Steelers had to change twice, mm -hmm. you know, the Cowboys had to change. I knew something was going to happen. The 250,000, I think reflects the fact that uh, our protocol has been so good and uh, there was an outlier, uh, we have not talked about it publicly, but it's been reported publicly. That did happen. And, uh, but they saw our procedures because there's so much reporting involved right now on, on how thorough we have been. So I think we've, we got some, the sympathy is not the right word, but maybe some acknowledgement that the Ravens have been doing the right things to try to make sure that our team is the healthiest and can stay in the schedule. Uh, and uh, I think that's why I, it, it, the fine was probably less than most people assumed. And I got to tell you, when the season started, I was happy as just a, a citizen knowing that there's some outlet for other discussion other than politics and, and COVID, the, the pandemic. So I was happy that the NFL was going to play. But I, I have to say, I never thought they would get through the season. 
I know it. You know, when it first started, I thought there'd be adjustments. I thought for sure we were going to have a 17th week or 18th week, whatever you want to call it. And there would be adjustments. I know when we were, they were adjusting our schedule and we were out of, you know, we had 27 players at one time or 23 players at one time um, that uh, we, we were suggesting to leave. Let's let us be the first team in there for that extra week. And you can adjust that way. But the league didn't want to do that. And they didn't want to do it with us. They didn't let us do it. They didn't let it do it when the, when the Broncos didn't have a quarterback. And uh, so they got it done. And uh, as you guys know, because you follow it, the TV numbers have been spectacular. You know, that uh, uh, when, when people were thinking that maybe the NFL was starting to decline, all the numbers are up, 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 uh, which is terrific for the league. And it shows that the quality of the product is, is good, but the game itself is great. The game of football is enthralling. You can watch it at so many different levels. I think that's the great thing with fans. You know, Tony, you're going to watch it differently than maybe a fan who only checks in on Sunday for the game. You're, you're going to watch it with a more sophisticated point of view. I'm going to watch the game differently, you know, because I've been in the league for 42 years. So it allows all those layers, no matter how much, how much you want. If you're a person just following the ball, you know, the snap of the ball, where's the ball going? You can love the game that way, or you can take it to other levels and, and have fun with it. Kevin, while you're on that point for a second, so Saturday I get back from some family from uh, celebrating Christmas on Friday and Saturday, as we as you know, we had three games, two on the NFL Network, one on Amazon Prime. Now, for me, for NFL Network, and I think it's the case with most cable outlets, to get NFL Network in the red zone, you have to pay an additional sports tier or sports fee for that. And then for Amazon Prime, well, that's something that my wife had long before I ever met her. So obviously I you know, have that account myself through her. So I was able to watch all three games. But, but people are going to ask the question, though, certainly, how is it in the best interest of the league, for instance, to put one of those games on Amazon Prime where a lot of other folks may not be able to see the game? What's the rationale behind that? Because I know they want to expand the sport among different mediums, but I'm just curious as to the rationale with that, what you think. Well, uh, first, the uh, uh, whenever it's on something like Amazon Prime, like, Prime, like the 49ers game was, you saw it in those two markets on regular television. Okay. So, so like when we have ESPN, when we're on ESPN on a Monday night, then in, um, there's a bid for it. And WBAL television currently has that bid you, and, and the, and the broadcast group that had it the previous game has the first crack to to offer the money for the next one so you always have your team your team will always be seen but to see all of them i think it's an indication that the league kind of puts out there to the whole world that there's another pot of gold out there you know let, let's take the super bowl let's let's just say okay uh, to watch the super bowl mike and tony it's going to cost you five dollars a, a household. Well, everybody would pay that, but that's a pot of gold that the NFL hasn't touched yet. Uh, and will it happen someday, or something like that? I think so. I think it will happen someday because I, I think these are experiments with it. it. Might not be the Super Bowl, but it might be a huge game of some sort. That all right? I'll, I'll pay five dollars to watch that you know, Ravens Steelers game on a Saturday afternoon. I'm just, just as a follow up, Kevin. So based on what I'm hearing, it's as much just an ability to uh, make an additional amount of money as it is maybe going after millennials who are maybe fringe fans. And we know that they do a lot of their consumption online. It's, it's probably more about the money, but maybe a little bit about trying to get those millennials as well. It is about the consumption of, of a younger generation that doesn't sit down and watch television anymore. You know, they're, they're, they're all here. There's their world's right here with, a, with a, a pad. So, um, but the, uh, there's a point, I think when the NFL reaches and we'll see what it happens, you have it a little bit in the NBA already where you can't ask the fans coming to the game, those 70,000 people in Baltimore coming to MT bank stadium. You can't keep putting the price higher and higher to pay for all the things that you have to pay for that become more expensive. 
you know, and, and, and player costs keep going up, you know, the cost of, of, of doing business is going up. It becomes more uh, sophisticated. The staffs never get smaller. I mean, the, the size of staffs now for coaching and personnel, which is the heart of the game, are massive compared to when I first got into the business. So all those costs keep going up and, and, and the cost to, to keep your stadium fresh, you know, which is, uh, you know, teams are doing now, you know, the Ravens have invested in M&T Bank Stadium. We've put, Steve Bishotti's put in hundreds of millions of dollars since that thing. We put in as much as it originally cost into keeping it upgraded so it's still a cool place to come. Hey, Mike, it's okay to admit that you shop on Amazon Prime. <laughs> I, I do a little, a little, but uh, I, I'll tell you this, though. If I had never belonged to Amazon Prime, I would have signed up just to watch the game because that's the kind of fan I am. I, I love I seeing football among all 32 teams. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I was uh, uh, I knew it was on some, but I, I didn't, you know, so I'm scrambling at the time. I'm going from one game to the other, and I had to to go to Google. Where can I watch it? And then I was pleased to see we had Amazon Prime on our television i don't i think that's the first time i went to it you know kevin a few years back when steve was doing the show down at the green turtle in ocean city with us one of the questions i asked him because we started talking about the creature comforts of watching the game at home and how do you replicate that at the stadium or how do you maybe give something at the stadium that you can't get at home now of course there's always the excitement of the crowd but but there's there's something more and i said could you see a situation or in the future, a time when like baseball, they started to play in smaller stadiums to make it more intimate, to give more things to fans. And he kind of laughed at me, but it's kind of a two part question. So with that in mind, do you think that with the COVID situation and the fans not being able to go to games that maybe some have gotten to a point where they said, you know, this isn't so bad. I got a brand new TV. I can do this again next year. How do we get those guys back? I know, and my clean bathroom is right there. And, right. You know, so, so yeah. I mean, <laughs> but that's a concern we've had for a long time. So you, you, you constantly have to work to make your, your stadium environment spectacular. You know, we, we spend long meetings and lots of time talking about how do we introduce the players? How can we make that bigger, better than ever? So that fans say, well, you got to go back and just watch – you know, the dragons, you know, or the big Ravens shooting fire, you know, which now the league, of course, stopped the, the fire, but you're, you're, you're constantly playing and tweaking so that fans come and want to come back again. And you also have to seek a younger audience because our generation, you know, our parents watched it. We watched it. Our parents had tickets. We got the tickets from our parents and then we invested and then our kids do it. Well, this next generation is not doing that. So you have to find ways to still get these the next generation interested to watch and at the same time make money from them. Well, and Kevin, I mean, that's a great point. I'm a, a little <coughs> younger than you guys, but I'm still, I'd like to say more of that old school where I like going to the games if I can. I always try to get to about two or three games a year. But my last two experiences – Last year against San Francisco in the pouring down rain. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was – that you was really have to day. be a true fan for that. And then the year before was the Tampa Bay game where I think it was snowing a little bit and raining. And, and Brooke <laughs> came with me. It was our first game together as a couple. And she got – we had great seats, 30-yard line. My best friend's seats, 30-yard line behind the Ravens sideline. But, hey, she went back up into the tunnel. She, she missed the second half. I was by myself. Those are the kind of games where you really have to be diehards, are right? Creatures of comfort with HD TVs, flat screen, NFL red zone. You know that's uh, that's tough, but uh, it, it is an interesting dichotomy. I know you guys do what you can, but I think ultimately you're still going to need those fans that are willing to enjoy the game day experience. I think some of that's the tailgating end of it, even before the game, Kevin. That gets people out, frankly, because it's a fellowship before the game. It is all that is built in, Mike, and you've hit on something and. We've talked about it internally. You know, do we have to reconfigure the stadium? Do we have to create party zones? You know, that so that a group of, of 20 to 35 year olds are gonna be like in a bar restaurant type setting, 
you know, with nice televisions and they pay a, a, a premium price. Well, okay, we can go out there and watch Lamar play live. And then I can come back here in a little bit of a strain. Well, I'll watch these big monitors here. Then I'll go back. But it's funny. If you go back like to the ice bowl, you know, we all know Scott Garceau. Well, you know, the, you know, who is a great Packer fan. There are, there are now a million people who said they were at that game, you know, because <laughs> it's an event. When you go and battle the elements with your team, it's a bonding experience. So there's a little bit of that. You go back to that, our Minnesota, remember the Minnesota game in the snow? Yes. You know, where, oh, Patterson, God, he kept ripping us, you know, in those last couple of minutes of the game, Cordell Patterson. And, uh, um, but, you know, I know how many people were there, but there are probably 500,000 Baltimoreans saying, well, I was there. <laughs> I, you know, I used my tickets that day. And, and uh, or somebody else who, who, who knows somebody with tickets. Oh, I was there. Somebody gave me tickets. So uh, 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 there are a lot more people who say they go to those special weather games than were actually there. You know, there's a, a, Mike and I were talking about this earlier in the show, Kevin, that looking at the 2020 season, that John Harbaugh, he's managed to, his team through some challenges, the COVID, all these kinds of things, the injuries, and they're on the cusp of being a playoff team again if they beat the Bengals in Cincinnati. And I said, given all that, I, I think John is should be considered for coach of the year. He probably won't be, but I think he should be considered for coach of the year. And, and he's also handled another thing very well, I think, and I think it speaks to the culture of your organization. And that is to take a leader like Mark Ingram and make him a healthy scratch in two games and still have Mark Ingram invested emotionally in that team. I, I think that just says a lot about the organization. Well, I think too, you're, I think you're right. But it says an awful lot about Mark Ingram. Yes. <clears throat> when, you know, when we go back to Ozzy starting, let's get people who want to play like a Raven. There is a, there's a certain way and, and really when internally, what is that profile internally for us? That's a person who loves every aspect, aspect of the game. Person loves to be in the weight room on a Tuesday morning. The person who loves the physicality that we play with a person who loves being a part of something bigger than himself, an unselfish person who happens to be a great athlete. You know, that's not, not always workable. And so I think the type of people you bring in, and if you look at the veterans we brought in through the years, you know, I think of Shannon Sharp and Rod Woodson, Mark Ingram, they are special people, Calais Campbell. They are special, great team guys, great locker room guys, unselfish heroes. And I think that's a big part of our culture. It's rare when we bring in somebody who makes the boat rock. And then going back to what John does, you know what I've been thinking about? I probably shouldn't say this because I'm still being paid by Steve Bishotti, but I will. This season's starting to remind me of 2000 and 2012. We weren't the darlings of the league in either of those years. You guys will remember 2000, we go five games without scoring a touchdown. We certainly weren't going to be a Super Bowl team, right? right? In 2012, I mean, there are parts of December where we look awful but we overcame it. We came back and we, we beat the Giants in 2012, the defending Super Bowl champions when they were fighting to get in. I mean, we really kicked them around. You know, and this is after Denver had beaten us at home. And so uh, we've been through some hardship. We are a hardened team that is relatively healthy. I mean, we're not gonna get, you know, Nick and Ronnie back or Tavon, but we're relatively healthy right now compared to what we were uh, five weeks ago and I like the feel of this team right now and, and a lot of it has to do with what you just said Tony the, the guiding light that John Harbaugh is as a head coach we're talking with the uh, long tenured PR chief for the Baltimore Ravens Kevin Byrne here on the resort video guide the Ravens rap show and Kevin let me ask you um the 17 game schedule we're hearing that it's likely that that's going to happen although the announcement is likely to be months away with that again TV rights have something to do with that announcement. And I think we can all sit here and say, yeah, we could add a game. I think that's good. But, you know, I'll certainly admit the way things are now at 16 games plus the playoffs, even as big a football fan as I am with both NFL and I also love college and high school. So you factor all those games in as well. 
I'm at the point where I'm pretty good. So, okay, I see 17, but I've got to imagine that that's probably the, the watershed point for the league for a long time to come. You know, you get to that point of diminishing returns. Your thoughts on adding one more game to the regular season? Well, if you look right now, Mike, there are 14 teams right now who are going to play at least 17 games, right? Because of seven teams from each conference making the playoffs. So you always have that. But it's going to be collectively bargained. You know, the, the players have a strong union. So you're going to have to give up something. And it, it could be the way you practice, the number of days you practice, the number of, of padded practices you can have, the length of your training camp, the length of your off-season program. So there'll, there'll be some tit for tat in there so that the players uh, don't have uh, as much wear and tear uh, in preparation to play 16 as they would to play 17. I'm not part of those negotiations, but I know that's a huge part of the discussion right now. Kevin, a couple of weeks ago, Lamar missed the game because of COVID. And he came back, seemed like he was rejuvenated. He seemed to have that, that boyish enthusiasm that he had in 2019. And all of a sudden it's back. And he's playing like he did in 2019 suddenly. And if I could dial it back even further, you mentioned before losing Nick Boyle and Ronnie Stanley. And, of course, you lost Marsha Yonda to retirement. With those three major losses to that running game, the fact that they're starting to look like they did in 2019, mm. there have been a lot of critics of Greg Roman this year, but no one can criticize that. No, it's amazing. Our, our run game, you watch every opponent we play. What's the first thing that coach is going to say on Wednesday when he talks to the media? Man, we got to deal with that run game. It, it's a different type of run game. It's a power run game. It's a power run game with lots and lots of movement that also happens to have a 300 pound fullback involved. Right. You have strong backs who are decisive runners. You know, we have three very decisive runners that are very good at putting that foot down and going so that the two yard run becomes a four or a five yard run or the five yard run becomes a nine or a 10 yard run. So, but it all starts with a scheme that is impressive. Greg Roman is, has always been good at the run game, but he's taken to new levels. And then you add in a factor with Lamar where defenses have to play you 11 on 11. They're not playing 11 against 10. They're playing 11 on 11 because that guy might be the best runner in the league. I've compared him when you guys have watched football for a while, I compare him to Barry Sanders. He, he's the only thing I've seen like Barry Sanders that can run sideways as fast as he can forward and make those quick little sidesteps to avoid big contact and then instantly be at top speed again. It's, it's, he's remarkable to watch. Kevin, the Ravens celebrating 25 years, and I know you were at the Cleveland Browns organization for a long time, and a lot of parallels there. I mean, blue-collar cities who have rich roots in the NFL, and, of course, both teams played each other back in the 60s, what, 64 and 68, uh, each getting the better of each other. But as you reflect back over the last 25 years, what are some of the, the, the events, or outside, of course, the Super Bowl, we know that, but what are maybe some of the events or themes that stick out from you from the 25 years and then kind of compare and contrast your time with the Ravens and the Browns. Well, I, I think the, the, the things that leap out immediately about the 25 years is going back to the beginning. Well, we let the fans decide what our name would be. I, I think that's so powerful, you know, because not everybody was going to embrace it because they were Baltimore Colts fan and they were angry at the NFL. And they thought Art Modell had done to Cleveland what Bob Ursay had done to Baltimore. And, uh, and then we, we just put Art Modell everywhere, you know, and, and so people could see that he was not uh, uh, an Ursae type, a Bob Ursae type. So I think that was important. The way the Baltimore Colts, Johnny Unitas, Lenny Moore, all those guys embracing us, being around us, coming to our practices, uh, us inviting them and wanting them around, wanting them to feel a part of, look, we know we're not your team and you're not our former players, but we can have a family atmosphere here. We want to embrace you. We want to put your arms, our arms around you. And hopefully 
you you'll kind of turn around and tell the public it's okay to like these guys. And then the fact that we come what in our fourth season, uh, was it our fourth? Yeah. 96, 97, 98, 90, our fifth season winning the Super Bowl, that gave us credibility that you can't buy, you know, and, and the way we did it, you know, it was a blue collar way, right? It was a Baltimore way. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It was with a, a defense that was in a single season, the best in history. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a lot, we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. You've been amazing. So thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy Hilton yeah. Head. And one more time for your, it's your son's art artwork. Behind our son, you? our son, Tim, he, he's, uh, he lives in, in Hartford off old Joppa away, media burn, uh, go to his website. Okay. That's an oil he did. Uh, and, uh, he's really good, <laughs> but thank you. thank you. Thank you. Hey, it's great talking to you guys. You know, let's, let's win Sunday and then let's see what's happened the next weekend. Five more in a row. That's all we need. There you go. <laughs> Kevin, happy new year to you and yours. I look forward to talking to you down the line. I appreciate your time this evening. All right, Mike and Tony, happy new year to you guys and your families. Happy new year. Thanks so much.